Hi there, good evening everyone to CTK, St. Stephen and to all the friends of our communities. Uh, as Father Aiden is coming, we'll go ahead and uh, play a video just to introduce him to it. Uh, so hold on one second. Father Aiden, welcome. After Father Aidan McAleenan became pastor at St. Columba Catholic Church in Oakland 12 years ago, he changed the building to reflect his largely black congregation. He hand-carved this African symbol for God, hung pictures of black saints, painted these angels he bought from Costco, even commissioned a new black Jesus. I mean, it was very interesting when we put it up. People cried. They did. It was so emotional to walk in to our church and there see the, the artwork looked like them. He also puts up a cross for every homicide in Oakland each year. And after George Floyd's death and the protests, he joined his congregation on the street in front of the Oakland Diocese headquarters. Black lives matter. I'm a good priest. I love, I love my people. And I want to do what is right for them. McAleenan tells me he urged Bishop Michael Barber to also take action, had a face-to-face -face meeting, but it did not go well. The Bishop of Oakland is a racist. Their meeting last Friday spurred this Facebook Live video. He said to me, black people should be happy with the way the church and this country has treated them. And in that moment, I got up and I said, I cannot believe what you just said. This meeting is over. His spokesperson tells me Bishop Barber did not say those words, but Barber declined my request for an interview. He did make a media appearance last month with other clergy, urging Governor Newsom to allow churches to reopen. Can't we reopen under the same conditions that the stores and supermarkets, marijuana clinics, tattoo parlors are opening under? His spokesperson also pointed me to this video released today in which California clergy come out against racism. So many of our brothers and sisters suffer daily from the injustice of racism. Bishop Barber is there but does not directly comment. He did hold an online service the day George Floyd was buried. We will observe a period of silent reflection and prayer for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. Pastor McAleenan says that's not enough, and he complains about a phone meeting Bishop Barber had with President Trump and other Catholic clergy in April, in which Barber praised the Trump administration. The bishops are more worried about white sensibility and the white European church, and they don't want to hurt their people. I, I think it's about this, if you're going to be really honest about it, money at the end of the day. That Facebook Live video received more than 30,000 hits before the pastor took it down. He now tells me he's made his point. Through his spokesperson, Bishop Barber tells me he's willing to talk to the St. Columba congregation anytime he's invited. For the I-Team, Dan Noyes, ABC7 News. So, Father Aiden, I want to welcome you to our communities of... Welcome back. Welcome back <laughs> to our communities of Christ the King and St. Stephen. We've, we've broadened our boundaries a bit. Yeah. after you left. Um, thank you for fighting the traffic and reaching almost on time. A um, lot of our parishioners were worried about you. They were praying for you. We wanted you to know that we had your back and you continue to have our support and support and love. Um, we've heard what you've said. So everybody has seen it and then we've given a little bit of the video that came out on the television. We want to know what it means to be black and to be Catholic in Oakland. Uh, how does your community feel at this time? Well, I, I think you would have to ask a black Catholic, <laughs> <laughs> really, uh, for that to answer to that question. Um, um, before, before I go on, when I was driving up here, I was thinking of B, uh, B. Murphy uh, when I first got here. I, I found myself wearing this Raiders t-shirt today, and I realized since I'm coming to this, Brian Joyce must have made sure that I wore a Raiders t-shirt to, to honor him. And I was thinking of B. When I got here, B said, Father Ada, you are on six months probation. I says, oh no, B, you are on six months probation. And so uh, uh, after four years and another year down at Holy Spirit, 
I didn't anticipate or thought I'd be going to um, uh, St. Columba. Uh, it's, ac it's actually tomorrow it'll be 11 years. And uh, my first four years is the happiest years of my life, I think, coming to Christ the King. Of course, Art Odom and maybe one other black person was at the, in the middle of uh, Christ the King. He could, could sort of stuck out a lot. Um, but when I got appointed there, I was very excited to, to go there. And uh, honestly, I thought uh, if anybody had called me racist, and they have, in fact, two days ago it happened, right out on the street, I, wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt with three black people called me racist. Uh, so you kind of don't get, ever get away from it. Um, but here's how a white person responds when they're called racist. And what I did say until I read the book, White Fragility, I instantly would say, I was born in Northern Ireland. I was a second class citizen. I am a Roman Catholic. My family, my history, and everybody around me were in a confessional state. As a child, I didn't feel that so much, but later when I came to understood, understand what that meant, then I went to the Republic of Ireland, and because it was from Northern Ireland, you, they, you were othered. Then I come to the United States, and I spent five years working in an AIDS hospice in San Francisco with no papers, what some call illegal. Again, I'm uh, a second-class citizen and less than. Um, so if anybody had ever called me racist, and they did, I would say, oh no, I'm a good person. I've been second-class citizen on four or five different occasions in my life. And when I read the book uh, last year uh, of uh, Robin DiAngelo, I cried. That Sunday, I had to get up and I had to apologize to the people of St. Columba for all of the different ways in which I had been racist. Yes, I never, I don't think I have much badness in me or much shadow side as we all do, but I never would intently hurt anybody. And I realized I had hurt a lot of the community in my lack of knowledge of the community and in trying to be loved rather than trying harder to love them and understand them, to appreciate their culture. In fact, Ron Harbour, the, par the, the guy that was uh, the administrator was there, when I got there, told me one day, he said, you know, you're very arrogant to think that you can come here and people will just like you for you. Instead of understanding our history, understanding our culture, un understanding who we are, where we have come from, how we come to be the black church. And a homeless guy said I was arrogant a few days later outside St. Columba too. So I said, God must be just telling me, giving me a little bit of a message somewhere or another that I need to up my game. Even though I'd gone to the Black Catholic Studies program that I found for myself when the diocese uh, Archbishop Corleone appointed me here. So over all of that time, I have the people of St. Columba have made me the priest that I need to be for this minute. Just like as a newbie coming to Christ the King, like Brian had to roll his eyes on more than a few occasions with me, Brian Timoney and the older priests here, I mean, and my new enthusiasm for what I wanted to do or what I said or my naivete, but they helped create that, the people of Christ the King helped me be the priest I needed to be to meet the next challenge and to meet the challenges of falling in love all over again with a totally new community. Um, and I have to tell you that those first few months I was there, I, I started having dinners every Thursday night, potlucks for the people. And uh, what I would have is that I'd like set it up like, um, Thanksgiving, and it was a potluck, and it was actually somebody from Christ the King who used to keep my wine uh, 
cellar filled with 50 bottles all the time. She has since gone home to God. If anybody wants to fill that role, you're welcome to. But uh, so in Vino Veritas, at the end of the potluck, uh, I remember distinctly one old African-American lady in her late 80s. She said, Father, I hate white people. Well, since I was the only white person sitting at the table, <laughs> and I said, really, why? And she said, when I was about 13 or 14 in Mississippi, my cousin, who was a year older than me, sat on the wrong seat on the bus. And he was pulled off that bus and lynched before my eyes, hanging from a tree. And as a little girl, I every time I see a white person, something... And so in that minute, I got it. I got why she might not... But Father, I like you. You're, you're different. Um, but I wasn't different. I mean, she when she saw me, that must have rang true of her. Another lady in the parish, in the first year I was there, said we had an anniversary. And I think Mike Hall might actually have been at that celebration. And uh, with this one, I overheard this one black lady say, Father, I or said another day, I don't even like that white Irish priest. And I was, I overheard that. Well, I avoided her like the plague after that. You know, who, who wants to be not liked? And November came, and I saw her standing at our shrine that goes up every year for November for the dead. And she was lighting a candle beside it, and she was crying. Something drew me to her. And I went over, and I said, is there somebody here that you're praying about? And she said, that's my son, that little boy, my only child. And he took his own life as an eight-year-old. Any concern she had about me being white or Irish or anything faded away. We were united and lost. And in that human thing. And I think that's the thing that, I, that comes to mind to me. And I watched the John Lewis funeral this morning. And the comments made were invited in Christ to make good trouble for the right reasons. And so at this moment in time, I feel like the people prepared me for this. Even in COVID-19, you know, we had two celebrations, a pastor's celebration one Saturday morning, which was a surprise. A hundred people showed up and beeped and put signs up. And my anniversary, uh, there was a big collection, which I was very happy about um, for me. and. It gave me this sort of strength and sense of being loved that every time I had issues with the Bishop of Oakland regarding the black church or not following the Roman rite exactly because he, that's what I feel he wants us to do. And we don't do that. And I inherited something going back 40 years. I wasn't sent to change the black church. He put me in an untenable position. And I eventually... I uh, had to let him know exactly how I felt, and, uh, and that's on him uh, to, to own his white privilege, to own his racism, as every white person in this country needs to do, and to challenge it and be Christ-like, to be Christ to the people. That's what the gospel teaches on his bottom line, to love and flourish and let everybody, God give everybody the, the right and made in his image and likeness. And I hold out, we know that race is, is a human construct. It's not a real thing. We all bleed red. We all hurt. We all cry when we're hurt. We laugh when, we're, when we love. And we all are the same at the heart of things. So uh, the community is 100% behind uh, this moment. They're hurting because of George Floyd. Um, have, you, have you taken a knee during eight minutes and 46 seconds, which we have done every Sunday? We did. It's, it's a long time. Even to be on one knee, it's a long time to think that another human being could do that. And we know so much more has happened to black people. And to hear the conversations that black parents have to have with their 
their sons and daughters and, and the fear that they have and yeah it's 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 I'm in the heart of the church and Pope Francis tells us the smell of the sheep um, I don't know what else to do only to smell of the sheep that's my vocation it's not it's not to be part of Roman Catholic Inc um, it's meant to be to be Christ to the world and to bloom where you're planted so I feel God brought me to this moment through all of the shoulders I stand on and all the experiences and I'm in the right place at the right time and I am very I feel very free and the people feel very free and they have actually challenged the bishop and he showed up which is a great thing you want to talk about it a little bit yeah uh, uh, you know I, I didn't think through I think um, what that video would mean that night I had sat in the church for half an hour on a Sunday night um, as a priest in your own parish with no other priests it's a lonely <laughs> afternoon and evening and I the more I thought about our conversation my conversation with him I didn't tell anybody because I knew if I told a black person what had been said at the guy they would lose it so I didn't tell anybody <laughs> because I was kind of afraid of but then the more I thought about it and I sat in the church for about a good half hour and then I just got my phone and went out and that's where that video came it's unscripted it's where I was at that moment it was as real as I, it might be a little lacking in its uh, cadence or emotion or but it was real and it was guttural and it was where I was at and so um, I, I really felt like I had a knife in my back with him at every time and I never felt supported by him ever so uh, I've been told by one psychologist priest friend that I had daddy issues uh, I told the, I actually told the people that uh, uh, but I think we've all got daddy issues we've all got issues of trying to become the person God is calling us to be so uh, in these interviews that happened um, in good faith I took the video down and I stopped doing interviews after the because I could see it escalating into something else I thought it was better to just take it down a notch and then he said the bishop to the reporters that he would meet with St. Columba so the parish of St. Columba wrote an amazing amazingly spiritual and beautiful letter inviting him and he came um, he came uh, he likes to do things in little groups as you guys know from Christ the King he's not going to come out and sit amongst a whole lot of people and face the music he wants to control it and be in his place but our people were like Bishop we invited you to our house this is our agenda and this is our parish council so he came um, I had offered him the book uh, DeAngelo's book and Steve Wilcox Steve Wilcox had clearly read it and owned his white privilege immediately. Uh, the, uh, the bishop, not so much. I think he introduced himself and, and said that he was there. Well, he brought two other black people with him, which did not look good to me. A, a black priest, Steve Bell, um, who is a Paulist and is good with arbitration and working together. And then one of our parishioners who works for Armenino and is, is with the diocese. Um, the optics of it didn't look good to the people or to me. Uh, but that's okay, they're good people. And um, Bishop basically said, I'm not a racist. I grew up in Sacramento, didn't meet any black people until I was in high school. Then he said that he went to the, to the Jesuits and there was just a few. And then he went to Guam and he cried when he got on the plane and left. And then, and then eventually he went to the military and then there was everybody. But I think what you could have just said was, I'm a good person and I'm not racist, was what he just said, which is what the whole book is about. But everybody uh, just accepted what he had to say. They had four asks. They had an introduction and then four asks. 
Um, and, and before I go on, Christ the King is not a poor black parish. Inner city, St. Columba is doing extremely well. And we, the one person as an example, it was the president, first woman and first black president of the American Cancer Association. I was at her inauguration in Atlanta. I flew because it was such a big moment. She's an example. Anne has been in that parish 72 years. And she's a woman of means and a doctor. And she exemplified who's on our parish council. And uh, so they had asks. And the first ask is, will, will you speak to the people uh, of the parish? So we're in COVID-19, so that's going to be a Zoom. He agreed to that. He uh, then was asked to set up the Black Catholic office. Um, and he, he was kind of agreeing to that, but also was kind of putting guilt on us and saying, well, we're in tremendous financial difficulties in the diocese. Um, it's not my place to say what he said because it's his words, but it didn't sound good. But we weren't there to feel guilty about what the diocese position was in. This is a legitimate request. And so they agreed that they would look into that, that St. Columba, St. Patrick's, and St. Benedict would be there as a resource to the Diocese of Oakland for racism and to educate people and be about the business of being Catholic, meaning universal, that everybody's accepted exactly what God has called them to be. And we are a resource to help any parish do what they need to do to be woke. So he didn't... Um... Oh, there was one more thing okay. that I can't... He, he agreed to something else. But um, I, I think our people need to hold his feet to the fire. But the thing that they didn't ask for, and I said at the end of it, the liturgy of St. Columba has to, if you do something in the Catholic Church for more than 20 or 25 years, in canon law, that's tradition. And that needs to be documented that it's okay for us to have the, the prayers of the faithful, after the prayers of the faithful, open prayers of the faithful. And as you know, as, as a presider, that can be difficult. Um, but I have no p problem calling people out if they start doing bouncing around. And then after that, at St. Columba, it's um, the uh, sign of peace. And you as the presider have to go to everybody in that church. And it isn't a choice. <laughs> we do, it takes 15 minutes. It can't be at that part in the church, in this liturgy, with these people. It could be, but at our, you know, it can't be. Um, uh, and also then the communion rite, we have lay, preside, lay preachers, just they preach. A, a former priest who is properly laicized and in the community and a good man preaching on Father's Day. If some, I'm not a father, biologically. This man can tell the three daughters what it is. This week, this time we had a, a father, a teacher from Haitian descent, talk about what it meant to him. I mean, these are the right things to do. And then communion, we have communion from people at the back of the church to the front of the church because black people couldn't go to communion first. The white people had to have communion first. Isn't that like, when you hear that, you kind of go, oh my God. But that's why we have communion from the back. People at the back door come first and the priest is the last to receive. So these are the things that, that, that need to be honored. Pope Francis, I think, would be perfectly fine with having an acculturated liturgy that represents the people of God in that place. What could be wrong with it? You don't have to slavishly follow every black word that's in the Roman Missal and do the red. We are more as pastoral ministers than uh, sacramental vending machines. We have to see the, who we have, we have to preach with the newspaper and the internet and the Bible in our hands, and that's what I attempt to do. You know, last week, uh, Father Leo Adjirli was here, and he speak, spoke about the fact that the American church is modeled on a European yes, church. Is. And so most of our bishops, including, mm -hmm. including some of the 
bishops of uh, of African descent, they have bought into right. the European model, and you know more than I do that Diocese of Oakland has moved in that direction. Once upon a time, the choir from Saint Benedict's That's used right. to come right. for every cathedral event. That's right. They seem to have vanished. Right. So, do you really feel in your heart that this whole discussion about racism? ends up into really accepting the black culture, meaning an inclusive liturgy where people feel the spontaneous expressions are welcome before God, if not before the Catholic Church. Well, you know where I saw that most? At Father Jay's funeral. The bishop wanted to have a Holy Roman Catholic event. And I spoke up at that meeting when we were preparing with a lot of pushback. And but it became what, what Jay needed to have and what the community needed in Oakland. That cathedral was packed. And when we second lined out of there with a brass band and all those New Orleans colorful umbrellas and everybody with their handkerchiefs in the air, it was pure delight. It was Oakland at its best. It was the cathedral full and vibrant of the people, for the people with the people and God was in the midst of it. And so the liturgies that the bishop likes and, 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 and he can like that. Uh, I'm okay with that. I love Gregorian chant. I come along in my little sports car and blast Gregorian chant coming down the freeway because I like it. But I would never impose that on the people at St. Columba. You know, the vibrant liturgies of the, of the Donna Suna times and, and, and the old cathedral. Um, the, the, the vibrancy of the parishes uh, around Oakland and, uh, you know, on one level, I have to admit, we have been quite left alone in many ways, you know, until these moments. Uh, so the, St. Columbus kind of sort of sits there and you, you know, the black church is about clapping. It's about expressing mind, body, and soul. The scariest thing I found going there was not having the security blanket of my Catholic prayers. To be able to pray just extemporaneously from, that scared the life out of me. I mean, I really did. I was, oh my God. But then eventually what you tried, you take baby steps and the next minute you're able to go on forever. And I can go on, obviously. But it's kind of like, you know, that you step into the tepid water of it and you, you embrace it so. The liturgy at St. Columba represents the people, and now we have gentrification. We take from a hundred different zip codes, from San Jose to Calistoga. There's a guy who drives from Calistoga every Sunday, non-COVID-19. Let me... Uh, and he, he comes, so there's a vibrancy in the liturgy and in the diocese that's still there. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's a difficult road going forward to get acceptance completely. Um, you did speak a lot about white, white church right. in your uh, right. in your uh, outburst or your little YouTube. It was an outburst. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you did talk, you used that word white church quite right. a bit. And I know that maybe Christ the King, may, or maybe St. Stephen, we probably sometimes, maybe cost quite often, or function as a white church. How do you challenge yeah, our but, community right here? But Christ the King... To me, I was sorry, Christ, Christ the King is the last chance for romance on the 680 corridor. In the sense that here comes everybody mm -hmm. that lives in the area. And I think Brian, Brian's heart was social justice and Vatican II oriented, along with uh, Brian Timoney and those, and then you've carried on that legacy. Um, I think there's, there's a, a woke social justice awareness and a want and a need to do the right thing, even in the midst of, like you see the St. Vincent de Paul, uh, and you see the, the, the community wanting to deal with the issues that bring those people there. We have to give people fishing rods rather than feed them. We have to attack the issues that bring those situations uh, around. So uh, I, I think learning more about what it is to be black in the Catholic Church. You know, one woman last year, two years ago, beautiful African-American woman, uh, 
as she calls herself, light, light skinned. That's how they say it. And uh, she went, became Catholic, was so excited, went to North Carolina for a holy day of obligation the following year. And, uh, with, uh, and as she was in some sort of business downtown, went to mass, and not one person would hold her hand at the sign of peace. And she cried. And that was because she was black. And this happens in this diocese quite a lot of other cultures or people. I mean, you think, oh, no, that wouldn't happen here. It happens. It happens, and it happens if other cultures do it too, to other cultures. You know, people who should unite together. So, uh, I forgot your question already. <laughs> oh, we're talking about a white, a white church. church. Yeah. You know, I come from, the, the, the Irish have a lot to, to, I actually apologize on behalf of Ireland one time in a homily. Because why would you be in a barrio in L.A. T teaching Latino kids about St. Patrick and St. Bridget? I'm like, yeah, St. Patrick and St. Bridget, yes. Look, I've got my little colorful green thing mask. But they should be learning about the Virgin of Guadalupe and, and the, the, the Latino saints and the Latino church. So we brought our culture. We own most of the bishop, bishoprics in the United States. We brought our, our Jansenistic Catholicism, uh, that limited salvation, that awful attitude to sexuality, and, and that strict Roman Catholicism to the states. We brought that instead of being who we were culturally as people. And so Jesus is seen in the crib as this little white dude. And on the cross, as a white figure, Jesus was a Middle Eastern man. Most people, you know, the personification of Christ and his mission, but it's not about Jesus. It's about Christ and the Spirit of God moving with us in the body of Christ now. We have to work towards that. And whatever we do to bring down those barriers and how communicate and help the bishop be the best he can be, and help the diocese be the best it could be, and all work together, and not be afraid to say, I had to say it. So I was a part of the white church. I know you. we, we, we challenge the bishop to a great extent. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the, the clergy at large in the diocese of Oakland, the, the diocese and leaders at large in the diocese of Oakland? Do you think we will all embrace Black Lives Matter? Well, I think... Um, our, well, that's kind of a complicated one, yeah, mainly because the clergy is mostly foreign-born. With all due respect, Paulson, Irish people are not foreign-born when it comes to America. That's a joke. Uh, but <laughs> you're foreign-born, I'm foreign-born. But uh, the majority of the clergy are foreign-born. And I think, you know, there's a thing that happens with seminarians. They all have to to get green cards and be here, they have to play the game and do whatever the consensus is on the field of the day. Um, so whatever, like the seminary system is, to, in my mind, wholly inadequate for the trained priests for today. So we need people uh, to be of the people, with the people, and living with the people, and be about the people. Okay, I Not in some little monastic cocoon. So the Diocese of Oakland, at this point in time, needs to celebrate the gifts and talents of the people that's right there. And everybody should be able to celebrate their culture, and everybody should be accepted. You know, the Latinos should be allowed to have a mariachi band at the Virgin of Guadalupe celebration on December 12th. Like Cordelioni would never let them into the cathedral. Because it wasn't liturgically correct. Yeah, most You're not serving the people yeah, of God. Most churches do. Most churches disregard yes. what the cathedral yes. does, and yes. they do it on our and own. The, yes. Yeah, yeah. You go ahead and do yeah. pastorally what is the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, and that's what I do. That's what I try to do. And I know you try to do it, and many of the pastors do it. But you're not going to get any thanks for it. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, I I I, I have admired you in a sense in this very difficult time 
and I asked you in the beginning about how your people feel. Mm. Um, when people from the Afri African American community has gone through so much, so much pain, and, and also feeling that church, their own church, mm. want to do nothing with them. Right. You're probably one of the lone voices in the whole of Bay Area from Catholic leaders. Mm. At least you made the television. Right, right. At least you made Facebook. At least you made a lot of noise. Why, why is the Catholic Church so silent? Why is the Catholic Church not there where our young people are, where our black people are, where so many of our white people are supporting all is there? Our I mean, black Catholics have been black Catholics in the United States before there was the United States. People forget that. A lot of black people think it's crazy. It's a white person's religion. But I, in actual fact, Father Kwame does a great course on that. Uh, on the, you have to really know your history. And you have to know the, the, the black people that had parishes and towns that got to the freedom of Spanish Florida and, and all of these places. Black people have always been here. But despite the racism, they love their church and they love Catholicism and they love Christ in this context. And despite the church, they hold on. And so at St. Columba, you can't go in the door and not feel welcome. And it's that moment of hospitality, inclusivity. No matter, I, recently, this, this uh, uh, a lady who was transgender started coming to our church, invited by a Christ the King person, actually, uh, Tom, uh, who was involved, involved in social justice here and came to ours, our church, and he invited her from Emeryville Tech to come over, and she started coming. And she told me one day, she says, you know, I'm Lutheran, and I've never felt as loved and cared for in my life. That said something to me, that the people accepted uh, everybody. Uh, one of our, uh, the head, our co-chair is lesbian, and she said, uh, Father, I'd like to start a ministry. I said, I'm not into siloing. I don't want you having some sort of gay thing over in the corner. I said, why don't you just throw a barbecue and invite people? So through a barbecue, she's very organized, A-type personality, and she got 30 people to sign up, 120 showed up. All those little old black ladies wanted to see who was going to show up, and they weren't going to miss out on some free food and drink. It was the best party I think I've been, ever been at. And every year we've had it every every time since. Yeah. I think but it's I taken to, the risk. I want to, yes, I want to pin you back to the question again. Why right. are we Catholics afraid to be out there to speak uh, up, especially our leadership? I think it's Catholics are kind of very quiet people. Uh, uh, and I can only talk about our place. I can't talk about other parishes. Um, St. Columba has a big voice. You've got those crosses every year. Um, we work with all the Protestant, Jewish, and other religions to attack those issues that make those crosses be there every year with the big goal of building the beloved community. So we speak out about that and we invite people along to that. It's choosing, it's choosing to do the right thing. It's, it's choosing to live the gospel. It's choosing, uh, it's hard, I, I think people, People are frightened of the retribution that might happen. People think, say to me, some people say, aren't you afraid? I said, no, I'm not afraid. I've never felt more comfortable in my own agency and in the spirit of God that, because what's, what are they going to do to me? They're going to throw me out of St. Columba and do what and put who there? You know, it's like I, the, they, they say that the best pastor is a pastor who knows he never wants to be a bishop. There's a freedom in that. You're not looking over your shoulder to see who's saying who, what, where, when, and how. I could give a toss about that. Um, although I must say, can I just tell you a quick little humorous yeah. story? Yes. I was in Rome with Mike Hall and Cindy Robinson and all these guys and we came out of the Vatican after me uh, celebrating mass with them and we came down this little You've been to Rome, Paulson, haven't yeah, you? I've been. You know that little street where all the ecclesiastical stuff yes, is? Yes, Art? yes, yes, yes. So we came down 
the the road that road and I went into the shop all these you know it's like candy it's like a candy store for priests and bishops with all this liturgical stuff and uh, so I went in and I got lost in it and these guys were saying, oh, Father, you want to buy this? You want to buy that? And uh, I found myself in a room with bishops' miters. Rows and rows and rows of bishops' miters. So I was in the room on my own. Yeah. You should. Uh, and I thought, I saw one in particular that I really liked. So I, thought, I looked over my shoulder. I put the miter on my head. And the next one, who was there? My call. And snapped a shot of it. Oh my God, I said, don't you ever. Now, Facebook wasn't a big thing then. I said, don't you ever put that up. They put that up on the last day I was at Christ the King. <laughs> I knew that photograph was going to show up. But in terms of fear, I mean, I, I don't know. I, you just have to have the courage of your own convictions. Because we all have to meet our maker one day. Or was I racist? Did I love my sisters and brothers? Did I meet everybody is made in the image of God. The Roman Catholic Church is not our European church. Pope Francis has made it truly universal in making cardinals that are from all over the world more universal and in, in making us be more of who we are. And that's everybody. So Aiden, thank you so much. Uh, right. You know, we, we've been over 40 minutes right now, but we oh appreciate you coming over. And uh, Are there questions? Are yeah, there are questions. There are, uh, but you answered them before they asked them. <laughs> <laughs> and there are over 160 people listening to you live wow. right now, and uh, they, many of them, write so beautiful things. Christ the King loves you. They mm. support you. They are behind you, and uh, you're not going anywhere. Right. And uh, count on us. Right. And and uh, your your own example, the words you've said. Uh, have made a lot of us here better Catholics in these challenging times. Well, thank you. So thank you again. Thank and you if uh, those of you who are following us on uh, Facebook, if you want to attend Mass with uh, Father Aiden right now in 15 minutes, feel free. We are doing the novena to our Blessed Mother of Perpetual Help, especially during this COVID-19. You come yes. from Belfast area. I come from, well, so, I was a former redemptorist. So, I, yeah, so it, my it heart. means a lot to you, right? Yes. All right. Along with Brian. Yeah, yeah. So Brian was uh, very much behind this of devotion. Of course. So thanks again to those of you who have joined us. And uh, next week, we will have someone more special. At this point, we are looking at a white girl, early 20s, who goes every week out there to Martinez and other places with a poster which says, defund the police, Black Lives Matter. She's a Catholic, she's from Christ the King, and we, ha we are going to put her feet to the fire, and she's going to put our feet in the fire, challenging us. So that's what we're hoping for. Thanks you again. Know, can I make a suggestion? Yes. Uh, the article that Father Jason did in The, uh, in the Voice, yeah. Jason has an interesting perspective as, as a non-white person. I thought what he wrote is something that he said and shared many times. And, and I think what Jason and Leo have said to me is, you're using your white privilege and, and saying things that we would be afraid to say. And you've given us permission to say it. And I, and, and I think it's a good thing. We need to give one another permission. 